um, we'll be doing some more of them. This is right back to the beginning. In other words, we're going to be talking about how to use the wonderful program built into Windows 10 called File Explorer. And we're going to walk around the computer so you get a bit of an idea and you won't have to look at my ugly dial anymore. You'll be able to um, see exactly what I'm talking about. So let's, um, let's make a bit of a start. You can now see the classic Windows 10 desktop. Everybody see that screen okay? Yes, good. Thank you. You'll notice that the screen is composed of what is called the desktop. There's a picture of that young lady running along the beach. And at the bottom of the page, there is the traditional taskbar, which is um, on every copy of Windows 10. Can be moved around, but normally is in the bottom part of the screen. Um, and you'll notice there's not much else there. And that's because this is a very fresh copy of Windows 10. We're going to be talking about the program called File Explorer, which I've just clicked on. It was one click only ever on the taskbar. So if you click it twice, you end up with two copies of it. So one click only on the taskbar. And you're looking at a pretty much basic Windows 10 installation. You'll notice there are a number of icons you can see, one labeled desktop, one labeled downloads, documents, and a few other things. You'll also notice if you look very closely, some of them have got little green circles with a white tick in them. And those that indicates that I'm using the program that is built into Windows called OneDrive. And um, this is not the time to talk about OneDrive. Jim Carmichael has done a session on OneDrive. And if you're not familiar with it, you really, really should be because it is the best answer to not losing your documents. I really recommend it and so inexpensive. On the left hand side of the screen of this file explorer, you'll see there's a button that says quick access and then a number of other folders down the side and one at the, near the bottom that says this PC, which I've just clicked on. And that gives you a different representation of what we're looking at. Now, getting right back to it, let's look at this file explorer. We're looking at the program right now on your screen. And up the top, and you may never have noticed this before, there's a little tiny arrow. I'm pointing at it now with my mouse. It says expand the ribbon. And when I click on that little button, you end up with a whole lot more options that you might not have been able to see. This is called a toggle key. In other words, if I click it again, it disappears. If I click it again, it comes back. And that applies to every part of File Explorer. And there are many, many things you can do in here. For example, one of the things I love doing in Windows 10, and I'm not recommending necessarily you do it, because it is a little bit advanced, I turn on an option that's called one click so that I never have to double click on anything. Everything becomes one click, but more about that later perhaps. So that's turning on the file ribbon, it's called. And if you own a copy of Microsoft Word or Excel or Publisher or one of those, they all have file ribbons as well. Very worthwhile. At the bottom of the screen, uh, before I get to that, let me just talk about a really basic thing. Everything in Windows is organized as if it was a filing cabinet. So if you imagine the, that old-fashioned steel filing cabinet that you have labeled Windows 10, and when you pull out a drawer inside Windows, that's called a folder. And inside that drawer, you can have lots of folders and you could have other folders tucked inside them. In the case of Windows 10, which I'll call Windows from now on, there is no limit to the number of folders and subfolders that you can have. Now, having things organized in Windows is, is absolutely vital. I get many calls, and I'm not looking at you, Greg Roberts. I get many calls from people who cannot find a document that they have popped in somewhere and they don't know where, where it's got to. And keeping things organized, as in real life, 
is an important part of it. For example, if I click on my documents folder now, in here you'll notice there are lots and lots of subfolders. There they all are. And inside each of these folders, if I go into one, there are lots more folders. So I keep everything very neatly so that I know where they, where they are. Can I say to you, when you are looking at your documents folder in particular, there's a great option up the top here that says search documents. Can you see where it is? I'm typing something now. I'll type in the word AVPLS, A-V-P-L-S, and press enter. And that's going to show me every document that I have in all these folders that has that word AVPLS, not just in the title, but in the content as well. So if you've written a document, which you've included some words that you remember, but you can't remember the name of the document, that search option up the top there, only new in Windows 10 is really worthwhile. It's a pretty basic thing to do. All right, let's just hide this because I don't want you to feel um, confused by it. I want to look now at this taskbar. This is the black bar I have at the bottom of the screen. You can see it has a little icon here, which is the latest version of Microsoft Edge. If you haven't got the latest version of Edge, I thoroughly recommend it. It means the end of all of things, all of the things like Internet Explorer and the like. This, this is a really fantastic program. It is in fact Google Chrome, but customized for Microsoft. Next to it was the File Explorer, that is standard. This little option here is called the task view. You can see it, I'm just pointing at it now. And task view, when I click it, produces uh, a little screen that shows me all of the other windows that I might have, have open at the time. Don't get worried about it, it's fairly minor. Next to it, there's the mail program that comes with Windows called, interestingly enough, Mail. And I highly recommend it. You know, for years and years, I've been a great devotee of using programs like Outlook and, and many of its equivalents, but the mail program built into Windows 10 is surprisingly efficient. And really, I'm getting to the point now of using it fairly exclusively. I can't see the point of, of configuring some of the more complicated programs. So that's the taskbar, that black band along the bottom. To the right-hand side of the taskbar, where the clock is, you'll notice there are a number of little icons there. And you know and recognize most of them, I'm sure you do, otherwise you wouldn't be here in this Zoom conference. But one of the ones I wanted to particularly mention to you was this fantastic thing called Windows Ink. You may never have seen and used it before, but it's on your copy of Windows, as long as your Windows has been updated recently. Whilst on the business of updating, can I suggest to you, if you're one of those people that turn on your laptop or your desktop computer once a week or something and then turn it off as soon as you've finished it, it's wise to leave it on for a couple of hours to give Windows a chance to update itself. So coming across to this Windows Inc, this option allows you to create a thing called whiteboard or a full screen snip. Now, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but it has some fantastic uh, things to look at. Let's look, look quickly at the full screen snip. Hopefully, you can now see this in the background there, and I'm writing on it. I put the figure nine. Can you see that? Please nod, please, if you can see it. Excellent. Thank you. So I can write on this screen. Now, why might I want to do that? Well, if you had a problem with your computer, you could say to the technician, look, I've got a problem with this thing there. And you can save that as a picture and send it to him. Uh, it's a very useful thing to do. And it's built into Windows 10 now, so I, I highly commend it to you. Back to where we were. Um, let's talk about the keyboard. Now, bottom left-hand corner, is the famous Windows Start key. I click it once and up comes a menu of all sorts of things you can use. Interestingly enough, I hardly ever use this. I, I, I find that it's much easier to keep a copy of what I want to use down on the taskbar. For example, you'll notice I've got a copy of Word 
2016 on this computer. If I wanted to, I could right click on it, which I've just done, and select the option pin to taskbar. As soon as I do that, you'll notice now, down on the bottom of the screen here, there's now a copy, a little icon of the Word icon, which allows me to start Word. Keeping in mind that everything that's down on this bottom taskbar is one click to start, not two. So that's the Windows Start button. Of course, on your computer, there's also, almost invariably, a Windows key on your physical computer, usually three keys in from the bottom on the left-hand side. And when I press it, which I'm about to do on my computer, up comes the same as if I clicked on that Windows key. If I press it again, it disappears. And frankly, after a while, that's what you'll use. So if I want to start a program, what I invariably do is I touch the key and I simply start typing the word, typing what I want to use, W-O-R-D, and press enter. And up will come a copy of Word. So that's a simple way to get into a computer program. Touch the Windows key, type a few letters of the word of the program you want to use, and away you go. All right, let's move on a bit. There are a few other options in here we are not going to talk about today. One of them is Cortana. Cortana is the Windows Siri, if you like, or the Windows Hey Google. And I don't think Windows is doing very well with it. There is talk in the trade of them getting away from Cortana because um, it's just not so appropriate for Windows 10. Siri is great for if you've got an Apple device and certainly, hey, Google, if you've got an Android device, but I'm afraid Cortana hasn't done so well. All right, now we're going back to, in the, th we're now moving on to the next part of this. We're going back to the File Explorer, which I'll just open up again. We're, what we're looking at here is the various folders that sit in my computer. The center folder is always called the word root, R-O-O-T, the root folder. And from the root folder, there are branches that stick out of it. And each of those branches is now called a folder. One day, once upon a time, they were called directories. They're now called folders. Even your desktop itself on your computer is a folder. And the recycling bin is a folder. And everything is organized <clears throat> hierarchically around that root folder, which has got a name. And I wonder if you know what it's called. The root folder in Windows is always called the letter C. You might ask me, why is it called a C? That's because in the good old days, there used to be an A and a B. And the A was a floppy disk drive and the B was a floppy disk drive. But we don't have floppy disks anymore. So rather than change everything, they start at the letter C. And in the days when computers came with DVD drives, and this one, this old one of mine has a DVD drive, but that's very unusual nowadays. Um, that was called the D. Nowadays, the D is invariably one of your USB sticks. Everything can be sorted in the computer by a number of choices. Let me go back into my documents folder and I'll show you what I mean. You'll notice that these are by default sorted alphabetically from AA private notes all the way down the list. But on the top of the screen, it says status, date modified and type. If I click on date modified that at the top there, it will reverse all of the entries in this folder so that everything is alphabetical. The very first one is AMP Claims Department, January 2001. I have got every document I've ever written since 1998, so I never throw anything away. And if I'm looking for something, often it's better sorted alphabetically like that. But date modified is a fantastic option because the advantage of date modified is it puts the newest ones right at the top. So when I look, for example, at Pamela Docs and Photos, 
you'll notice it's dated 29th of June 2020 at 2.41 p.m. in the afternoon. So it's sorted now. All of these folders that are subfolders are sorted by date order. And this same thing applies to documents. Um, if I went into another folder, let me think of recipes, for example. There's a whole lot of Word documents in there. They're all sorted alphabetically. But what about the case when uh, Pamela says to me, do you have a copy of that fruitcake recipe I gave you two days ago? Well, I've got a lot of recipes in here. So if I clicked on date modified, it would mean that at the top of the list, that could very, that is the most recent document, 22nd of May, 2020, the Moroccan lamb. So it would be an easy way to find it now in date order. And that's actually more appropriate for something like this. Whenever you close the window, however, it goes back to being alphabetical. So you can't muck it up here. Now, let's talk very briefly about sorting by type. That's the option which is, you'll see at the top there, I'm pointing at it now, it says type. When you click on type, it sorts the content so that the various types of file are sorted alphabetically. In other words, this banana bread original recipe dot JPG is a picture. And it means all the pictures would be together by file type. Below that are all the rest of the documents, mostly Word ones. That's sorting and knowing how it works is working, knowing what files are is a very worthwhile thing. So when you see something with a, the letters DOC on the end or DOCX, you know that's a Word document. When you see the letters PDF on the end, it means it can be read by that Adobe Portable Data Format program called Adobe Reader. Absolutely wonderful program. I'm sure it's something the Windows rest, wished they'd invented. And knowing it, the size of the document, you'll notice if I click on size, it's going to put the largest document I have there at the top. So the banana bread original recipe happens to be the largest file there of 913 kilobytes, which for your interest is about the size of the old floppy that you used to have in your computer. So that's sorting and doing it in different ways. Let's talk now very briefly as we're rushing along here about the famous cut, copy and paste. You will have read in the newspaper recently, the man that invented this passed away about a month ago and he thought of the idea of copying and pasting. How we'd ever get on without that in computing terms um, nowadays, I can hardly imagine. So copying and pasting, I'm sure you're familiar with it, but there are a couple of golden rules to remember. The first thing is that if you cut something, it removes it from where it is, and when you paste it somewhere else, it puts it in that place. If you cut something and then don't do anything, and restart the computer, it won't have removed it. If you want to move a file from your computer to a flash drive, a USB stick, you've got two choices. You could either copy it or you could cut it. If you cut it, it means it will take it from the hard drive on the computer and put it on the USB stick. But if you copy it, it leaves a copy on both things. There's also an option called drag. And drag is a, a really useful thing, but dangerous. Because uh, I, I use it because I'm very familiar with it. I've been doing it for a very long time. But dragging things means that you could very easily drag files and put them in a different folder, and then you're in a big mess. So let's not worry a bit too much about dragging right at the moment. If you want to copy something, there are two or three ways to do it. And I know this is probably pretty familiar to you. Let's look at the very top on the banana bread original recipe. I'm going to press the right hand mouse button on my little mouse and it will bring up a whole lot of different options. 
But one of them is the word copy. I'm pointing at it now. If I click on copy, and I'm talking about the left button now, if I click on copy, nothing actually happens. It just copied that bananas bread original recipe into the computer's random access memory so that I can use it again somewhere else. So if I wanted to put it, for example, into a different folder, I could very easily do so. Let me just prove that to you by opening up a little folder on my computer. Uh, let's one here, I always have one called Z. Now to copy it into there, remember I top mentioned it's in your computer's memory now. That unfortunately only one thing at a time. It's a bit like blokes, you know, we can only think of one thing at a time. So it's now in the memory and I'm now going to paste it in there. Now there are three or four ways you can do it. The simplest way is to right click on your mouse and select the option paste, which I'm going to do by left clicking on the word paste. And now you see, I've now got a copy of the banana bread original recipe sitting there in addition to the original. So I've got two copies. And that's really a nice thing to do because it means I can now fiddle with this recipe, change it around. But if I really don't like it, I've still got the original to play with. If I had put a USB stick into my computer, I could have copied that file onto the USB stick. And you might like to keep in mind that if you copy something and you paste it, you can copy it again as often as you like until you restart the computer. So you could paste it into 10 different places if you wanted to. Of course, if I, I can now safely delete that file. Now there are three or four ways to delete a file, but probably the easiest one is to highlight the file as I've done and press the delete key on the keyboard and it's gone. If I've made a mistake, I wonder who can remember how to get it back. Yes, I could go to the recycle bin, but I could also do that magic key, control, hold the control key down and press the letter Z, which returns it to where it was. So if you make a mistake, control Z is the most wonderfully useful key combination. And at the end of this thing, I'm going to send you all an email with a whole lot of shortcuts. And that's the, one of the primary ones. Control Z it means you can go back about a hundred steps. If you this applies, if you're inside Microsoft Word or wherever you are, you can use Control Z to return to what you had prior. And just for your interest, Control Y, the letter adjacent to Z, goes the other way, so that you can um, re reverse what you've just done. I'll let you play with it when you after this session. So there is, I'm going to send you all this list of these shortcuts, but that is the sort of things. Just for the moment, I could also delete it by right clicking it and selecting delete. Same thing, and it's gone. And you remember how I put it back if I made a mistake? Control Z puts it back. I could also drag it and put it into the recycling bin. Now, I don't recommend this method because you can get into trouble, but watch me do it. I'm dragging it down here. I'm going to drop it in the recycling bin. It's gone. It's in the recycling bin. And if I didn't like doing that, I could put it back by going control Z because it control Z will always reverse what you did. All right, finally, in this little session today, and I'm going to, I think we've, we've got so much to talk about. We're going to have to, you know, do a bit more of this later on. I want to mention a couple of very useful things for the computers that many people do regularly. There's a wonderful option built into, into Windows called the Disk Cleanup. Now, this Disk Cleanup gets rid of all the rubbish on your computer. There are programs you can download that claim to do this. I do not recommend them. It's got to the stage nowadays where the most famous of them is one called C Cleaner, but it's now riddled with all sorts of advertising and rubbish. It works perfectly well. So clean up, I'm going to show you how I'm going to do it. I'm going to press the Windows key on my computer, which I've just done. And I'm going to type the word clean. 
C-L-E-A-M. And you'll notice right at the top of the list, there's this app built into Windows. You've got a copy on your computer called Disk Cleanup. I've selected it and it's now working out for me what it can get rid of. And if you look at this list, there are all sorts of things. Look at this huge file here, delivery optimization files, 657 megabytes. That's a lot of space, which is not required by Windows. How did it get there? Because when Windows updates itself, it leaves all this rubbish lying around. So to get rid of it, I just click on OK. And it says, are you sure you want to permanently delete these files? Now, don't get worried about this, folks. You cannot get into trouble over it. Just say delete. And the computer now is busily working away, getting rid of this rubbish, giving you back to your computer a lot of storage space it didn't have. It's gone. It's done. In your case, you may never have done this, and it could take 10 minutes to, to be used. So don't, don't get nervous about it. Let's also talk finally about the option of using an antivirus program. I mention it because Windows 10 has refined itself to the point where now, in my opinion, there is no need for external virus programs, antivirus programs. The one built into Windows uses the core provided by many of the other companies. And really, I don't believe, particularly if you use Microsoft OneDrive, I don't believe you need to have any other protection. Most of it is quite expensive. I'm told, as I read lately, that a lot of the free ones are in themselves full of all sorts of nasty things. So I just stick with the Windows one and you'll never even know it's running. It's quiet in the background. It never pops up and tells you anything. And uh, I, do, I do like it. In particular, if you use OneDrive. And uh, for those of you that missed out on Jim's excellent talk on OneDrive, you can review that video on the avpals.com website as you will be able to this one as well. It's really worth uh, worthwhile. You've already got a copy of OneDrive on your computer, whether you like it or not. You can't take it off. So why not make use of it? I, I, I do thoroughly recommend it. So that, folks, is it. I'm not going to um, carry on too much more because I believe that that's a good introduction to the, the, the basics. Remember, everything in Windows is organized by folders and you can have as many subfolders as you wish and, and you should organize things. And so if you've got pictures in your documents folder and documents in your pictures folder, you shouldn't because it's, it, it's much more sensible to have it just the way it comes with Windows. Thank you all very much for, for your attendance today. And I'm here now to answer the questions. Yes, who, thank you, Paul, for a great presentation. Um, you can unmute yourself. Uh, uh, I've tried to unmute you from here, but unmute yourself and then put your hand up and we'll take you in order and you can ask Paul questions. Yes, first question. Uh, John. Hello, Paul. Thank Hi, you very much for that uh, very good uh, presentation. I just wanted to ask you, uh, what's the difference between defrag and disk cleaner? Yes, good question, John. Um, there's a huge difference. Firstly, um, Disk Cleaner just gets rid of files that are no longer necessary that have been put there by Windows itself. Ne never your files, only files of their own. The defrag expression refers to the rearrangement of the bytes that are sit on your hard drive and is no longer required in Windows 10. Yeah, defragging a drive today is totally a total waste of time because quietly in the background windows is defragging your computer all the time and you can sort of tell if you look at the hard drive light on your computer and if you're not doing anything after about one minute you'll see it starting to flash and that's because it's defragging without you asking it okay. i hope that helps thank you that answers my question Yulsa, did you have a question Yes, thank you very much. It was very interesting, although I have Apple computers. 
Uh, there's just one thing that really interests me is that cleanup. Is there something like that on the Apple computer? I have a laptop and a desktop. And my laptop is older, it's about five years old, and it's wonderful. It works, it's fast, it's everything. My desktop is only um, a year and a half old, and it's slow, and I think <laughs> I'm untidy. I learned a lot about today about folders, because that's a lot of that is similar to the window. But I haven't, uh, that cleanup really interests me. Yes, it's, um, look, really, for, for many years, I used commercial copy, commercial editions of that sort of thing, but the one built into Windows works perfectly adequately. Um, it, we, we could spend another half hour talking about how you can fiddle with that to make it even better. But the basic format of it is really useful if you're getting, particularly if you're getting short on disk space on your computer. Yeah, but is there something for the Apple? Is it the same? Is there cleanup, something like that? Yes, there is. There is. Um, I am not uh, an expert on Apple, and I don't know whether there's an in. I'm pretty sure there isn't an inbuilt application for Apple, but um, it's certainly there are applications for Apple. Yes. But you say to be careful to buy some because it comes up sometimes when I go on Google or go on Facebook or something and say, "Did you know this is available to clean up your computer?" But I haven't clicked on it. Well, remember, they're only advertising because they're going to make money out of it. That's the bottom line. And, that's, that's... and, and uh, you know, you can hardly believe anybody nowadays is getting to that, that point where anybody that pushes something at you, they've got a barrow to push, and I just ignore them. Um, yeah, I'm glad to hear that. So I haven't clicked on anything. So no, I put into Google, clean up my computer, <laughs> and it would... Well, but you'll get the first 30 options in Google will be commercial products. Oh. where you, all you need to do is press that Windows key and type the word clean up and you'll be awake. Okay, thanks very much. Pleasure. Yes, who's next? Don't, don't be afraid to ask questions. We're... I don't mind how simple it is. Jan. When I'm using Facebook or Messenger, I sometimes have trouble getting my photos to go through because they, some of them seem to be in pictures and some in a program called Photos. I haven't worked out how I can put them all into one place so that I can then use them better. Okay. Um, well, then you're talking about photos that you have... Photos I've taken mostly and downloaded into the... Okay. The photos that yeah. you've taken with your, let's assume with your camera, which is yeah. probably an, an iPhone or an Android phone, hmm. if you've copied them to your computer and you've put them into the photos folder, not any other folder, yeah. they will appear in the app that's built into Windows called Photos, which is a very good program. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Surprisingly good for Windows. I, I, I don't want to run... Microsoft down here, but very often some of their stuff is fairly ordinary, but the photos program is very good. So working out, the most important thing is I would create a folder inside below the photos folder and in there put all the photos you want and they'll all appear in photos if you do that. Right. Jan, some if you've got some any... of them are, are photos that I've had. I have nieces in America, they send me photos oh. or they're on Facebook from them. And when I want them, they're in a different fold. And not always easy to come across. No. Well, I would suggest you move them by either copying them and pasting them into a folder inside photos. Yeah. Or if you're brave enough, cut them. Use the cut option and then you don't end up with two copies on your computer. Frankly, it's the greatest time waster having two copies of things because, oh, yes. you know, it's appalling. Yeah. My... my... My phone now, my computer doesn't recognise my phone. Even when I actually plug it in and say, download the photos, it, it says it can't find them. And do you have a, an Apple phone? I have an old Apple phone, yes. Yes. Yeah. I would recommend to you a little app. Uh, I'm just suggesting this to you. I'm just looking it up on my old phone. And it's called Wi-Fi Phone. It's free. Yeah. So it's two words, Wi-Fi Phone. And that little app, which is very tiny, um, will easily move the, your photographs uh -huh. from your phone to your computer. 
Thank you. I have Google Photos on my iPad and they go straight into the computer. They do. Give that a try. All right. Thank you. Anybody else got anything else they'd like to add? Okay. Before well, you go, um, I'd just like to thank Paul, but I, I just want a quick survey. Um, Paul and Jim and I have been working today and we've got a meeting on Friday that apart from our Tuesday our presentations, we are thinking of running a questions and answer session. So if you do have questions and answers, we've worked out a way to put you into a little side room and, and we can individually have a chat with you. What, 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 what's the feeling about that? Anyone um, could put your hand up if you think that's a good idea. Yes, I do. Yeah. I think what Greg's yeah. trying to say is this is a bit like going back to the way we used to do it at Avalon, mm. where, where you have a one-to-one -one situation. So here's Jan asking me quite a technical question about how to get photos off off the phone and putting it into a computer. Now that actually, I gave a very, very brief overview of that, but how nice it would have been for me to be able to say, all right, Jan, we're going off to a breakout room, just yeah. you and I, and we'll talk about it and we won't bother everybody else. Mm. So I think, I think it's got quite a lot of merit. We're gonna give it a try anyhow, and we'll see how we go. We're, we're actually doing this because um, we're still a bit worried about starting up one-on-one -on -one um, and even um, the, the presentations we have at Newport, because I don't think, and a lot of us don't think that we're out of the woods yet with this COVID-19. And because of our, our um, seniority in the community, we just feel it's, we, we don't want to put anyone at risk. So that's why we're trying to look at ways of expanding what our pals does. Mm -hmm. You might like to remember everybody, I'm going to send you a file. You'll get it in about 10 minutes time by email, which is a list of all the shortcuts. Um, it's invaluable thing. And um, don't forget, finally, Control Z. It's a fantastic option. Greg Roberts. Oh, you'd have to unmute yourself, Greg. Right. Top right hand side of the screen. Oh, there you yeah, go. No, no, I got it. I, I sort of disappeared and I was waving, but I, I didn't realize I, I wasn't on the screen. Anyway, my question was just following that business of uh, removing photographs from camera, uh, from iPhones and putting them on. Uh, on the computer, what, what, what is, how do you do that with cameras? You know, a, a sort of a camera, one of those things that you, we yes. used to use. It's a good question, Greg. The truth is it's much easier from a, a, a non iPhone because uh, you would just use the, the little card that's in that camera and your, your laptop's on invariably got a slot for the SD card. If that's what it is. Yes. And, yes. And that's, that, then that's the same as using a hard drive and it's very easy. You just select them all. The shortcuts you'll see that I'm going to send you is that famous one. I've talked to you about it before, Greg. Control A, which is holding the control key down and pressing the letter A. That means the A stands for all. And that would yes. select all of the pictures. And then you could simply move to your pictures folder on your computer and paste them in there. Um, but um, look, really, it's not a basic Windows function, which is the point of today, but it's very interesting, is it not, Greg and Jim, how quickly we morph into photographs so often in these discussions. And uh, Greg has made a good point of that. Yes, Jeanette. Can't hear you, Jeanette. You're muted, Jeanette. Can you unmute yourself, please? Yeah, there you go. My question isn't really about folders, I understand that. It's about backing up, say, for instance, any emails I receive. I don't want to print them out. So back them up onto a USB or something. What's your suggestion? Well, Jeanette, this is what I would say to you. What is your email address, may I ask? I've got a couple. Well, email this... and ping pond. Mm. Well, first thing I would say is I wouldn't use a big one of that. That's the number one thing. I would, the time has come to move away, in my opinion, 
from using an email account related to your internet service provider. And the reason I say that is you're very likely to change from Telstra to, to somebody else one day and then you're stuck with that problem. If you're using Gmail or Yahoo or one of the others, they're backed up whether you like it or not. They're kept by Google on their servers, not on your computer. So there's no need to back them up. Right. And, and you certainly can. Do you use Outlook to read your mails or not? Outlook. Yes. Well, Outlook, there is an option in there that lets you back up the email. Um, it's not the place to talk about it here, but it is certainly possible. And maybe we can think about talking about how to do that. But I think if you've got a number of email addresses, you should start to wean yourself off the big pond address and go for the world's biggest, which is email. I do think it's more stable. You're less likely to get any sort of spam and it, it just always works. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, next week, uh, if you're interested and you've been watching